Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ethan Tucker. I am a Wexner Graduate Fellowship Class 11 and uh, currently Rosh Hashiva at Mechon Hadar in New York City. And really delighted to learn with you uh, this passage, this uh, material on Hanukkah. And uh, we're going to focus tonight on one passage by a very intriguing figure, Rav Yitzchak Hutner, who I'll say a bit more about in a moment. I know you've seen some introductory text to set up this piece, uh, and we're going to build on those to follow this larger essay, get the main ideas and principles that emerge from it, and then try to extract some lessons for leadership and for our own personal lives that we can draw from it. So let me say a word first about the author to orient you to this piece uh, and give you a sense of where he's coming from. Rav Yitzhak Hutner is, to my mind, one of the uh, sadly underappreciated Jewish educators and teachers uh, of the 20th century. Uh, he is most well known uh, ultimately for his work in the United States uh, as the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshivat Chaim Berlin, uh, where he was the head of that very serious and uh, Im highly impactful institution of uh, Jewish learning. Uh, but he has an interesting biography. He starts out, as do many 20th century American rabbinic figures uh, in Europe, and he has three main influences on his thought. Rav Hutner is first and foremost influenced by the yeshiva world, and in particular the Slobodka yeshiva, one of the Musar yeshivot, one of the yeshivot that was focused in the late 19th and early 20th centuries on ethical development among the students. Not just the question of becoming a master of rabbinic texts, but focusing on having those texts actually affect the way one lives and how one lives out an ethical and purposeful Jewish life. What was distinctive about Slobodka Musar was that it focused on the universal value of the human being and the ways in which human beings had a spark of the divine essence within them. And the way a person perfected their character was by focusing on that divine, unlimited uh, element of themselves and using that to kind of bootstrap themselves up to a higher state of ethical and moral behavior. That's his first place of learning the world of the yeshiva in that perspective. A second major influence uh, on Rav Hutner is the thought of Rav Kook and the world of mysticism uh, that motivated Rav Kook. Rav Avraham Yitzchak HaKohen Kook was the first chief rabbi of the land of Israel. And uh, Rav Hutner encounters him and uh, engages with a whole world of mystical thinking uh, that was not really a central piece of the Slobodka Yeshiva culture, um, but which opens him up and forces him really to develop and think more deeply about transcendent concepts, uh, the role of history, God's role in history, uh, and the ways in which uh, that affects the Jewish people over time. And we'll see a piece of that in this piece as well. Uh, the final third piece of influence, which is from a very different area, is he spends time at the University of Berlin. And it's there that Rav Hutner encounters Western thought and Western philosophy in particular. And I think you could fairly say that Rav Hutner, as an intellectual figure, spends much of the rest of his life translating insights that he found in Western culture and Western thought and Western philosophy into the idiom of the world of the yeshiva. And what we're going to look at today is a passage from his Pachad Yitzchak, which is essentially a posthumously edited and collected set of talks that he gave at his yeshiva, Yeshivat Chaim Berlin, when he ends up in the end in America. Uh, and these talks were given to yeshiva students, if you will, to an inside group. And the, the, the vision of these sichot, of these conversations with the students, was to try to find a way in an emotionally direct way to connect so many of those elements of Rav Hutner's learning uh, directly to his students. So we're going to begin by looking at this text, and it's going to build on the six sources that you've already seen. It comes in the collection of his essays about Hanukkah. Pachad Yitzchak is organized around the holiday cycle. And we'll see very quickly what the connection is. So on the sheets that you have, you can find uh, the beginning of this passage, Pachad Yitzchak by Rav Yitzchak Hutner, from the section on Hanukkah, essay number three. 
And he begins as follows. The Midrash says about the word darkness, which appears in the second word of the Torah, darkness, this alludes to Greece, which darkened Israel's eyes with their decrees. We have a tradition that Yosei ben Yoezer and Yosei ben Yohanan, who lived during the days of the Hasmonean conflict with Greece, were the first ones to engage in a dispute of Torah law. In other words, on account of Greece's darkening of Israel's eyes with its decrees to make them forget your Torah, this darkening forgetting led to the first dispute in the Sanhedrin. In this sense, the ongoing proliferation of opinions and dissenting positions continues directly from the darkening of Israel's eyes via the forgetting of Torah caused by the decrees of Greece. In this way, a superficial glance leads one to perceive the proliferation of opinions and dissenting positions as a remaining holdout from the redemption from Greece. For even with the whole redemption and salvation of the Hasmonean victory, the very same sorrow which was born in the polemic with Greece still remains with us. Now, Rav Hudner here begins with the traditional text of Al Hanisim, which is said in the liturgy as part of the grace after meals and as part of the daily prayers on Hanukkah, which casts the action of the wicked Greek government against the Jewish people as being about causing them to forget your Torah, Lehashkicham Torah Techa. And Rav Hudner joins that together with another Midrash, which associates Choshech, darkness, already used in the second verse of the Torah, as alluding to the Greeks, and in particular the, Greece, the Greek dominion over the Jewish people. Darkness, choshech, and forgetting, lehashkicham, shachach, these two words which use the same three-letter Hebrew root, are linked together, says Rav Hutner, in that we find that at the time of the Hasmonean rebellion, at the time of the Greek persecution, when this act of forgetfulness is going on, another act of forgetting is going on, which is forgetting the law. Jews under the Greeks are being forced not to study Torah anymore. This darkens their eyes, and as a result, they also forget much of their Torah. One of the things that happens when you forget something that you once knew is two people then begin to argue over what the right answer to questions are. And Rav Hutner notes that it is precisely at the time of the Greek subjugation that we have the beginning of the phenomenon of rabbinic dispute and disagreement. So paragraph one here is beginning with the notion that the Greeks caused us to forget Torah and they left us with arguments and disputes. And this is actually troubling. Because one of the things we know about Jewish culture and Jewish rabbinic culture until this day is that what characterizes it is dispute and argument and disagreement. How can we thank God and note in history on Hanukkah that the Jewish people were redeemed from the Greeks if the very thing that was the result of their persecution, namely our forgetting Torah, is actually still in full force? And this is now where Rav Hutner will move forward. He says, however, in the second paragraph, from the words of the sages, we learn a deeper perception in the heart of the matter. Quoting the Talmud, sometimes the canceling of Torah is its fulfillment, as is said, which you broke, asher shibarta, more power to you for breaking them. The act of breaking the tablets is an act of fulfilling the Torah by way of canceling it. But the sages also said, that had the tablets not been broken, Torah would not have been forgotten from Israel. We find then that the breaking of the tablets also had an aspect of making the Torah forgotten. We learn an amazing innovation from here, that it is possible for Torah to be proliferated via the forgetting of Torah, such that in this manner it is possible to receive a yishar koach, more power to you, on account of forgetting Torah. Go out and see what the sages said, the 300 halachot were forgotten in the days of mourning for Moshe Rabbeinu, and Otniel ben Kenaz restored them with his dialectics. Those words of Torah, recovered through dialectics, those are themselves words of Torah that were proliferated only via the forgetting of Torah. Moreover, every matter of dispute in halacha exists only via the forgetting of Torah. 
Nevertheless, so taught the sages, even though these say pure and those say impure, these invalidate and those validate, these exempt and those obligate, these and those are the living, are the words of the living God. We find that all differences of opinion and disputes are an expansion and an embellishment of Torah that draws its strength specifically from the forgetting of Torah. Now here Rav Hutner takes the next interesting step. He juxtaposes two texts in rabbinic literature that reflect on Moses' act of shattering the tablets he received on Mount Sinai. And the Talmud actually says two very different things about that act in two different places. The first thing it says is that God was pleased with Moshe's decision to shatter the tablets and said to him, Yishar koach shashibarta, well done that you broke those tablets. And in another place, the Talmud says, that had Moses never shattered those tablets, not an ounce of Torah ever would have been forgotten by the Jewish people. It would have been indelibly, gra indelibly ingrained on their hearts and in their minds, just as it was on those tablets. And Rav Hutner juxtaposes these two texts and says, well, actually, taken as a pair, these texts are saying something remarkable, which is that sometimes God commends us on forgetting Torah. How can it be that God would commend Moshe on shattering the tablets if it led to the forgetting of traditions, unless sometimes it is commendable to forget Torah? All of the disputes that we have in our tradition are, says Rav Hutner, on some level, the residue of forgotten Torah. And yet, what does the rabbinic tradition say in another set of sources? It says that over time, after Moses forgot, caused the people to forget those traditions, others rose up after him and restored new interpretations, new understandings of those earlier texts. And rabbinic tradition understands that variety of opinion to actually be greater than the original Torah that was forgotten. Why? In every dispute, there are two sides. And the rabbinic tradition says in the Talmud in Eruvin that whenever there is a dispute, this side and that side, both parties, have captured something of the divine essence and their words are both the words of the living God. That shows us that on some level, the act of forgetting Torah has led to the multiplication of Torah, to the furthering of it in the world. He draws this out in the next paragraph more clearly. An even greater innovation emerges from this. For the power of oral Torah is much greater in the context of difference of opinion than in the context of agreement. For included in the statement that these and those are the words of the living God is the principle that even the opinion rejected from halakha, from Jewish law, is a Torah opinion, provided that it is said according to the boundaries of the give and take of oral Torah. Should the proponents of this view arise as the majority later on and decide according to the rejected opinion, henceforth the halakha would change in its essence. The disputes that arise in Torah are a positive creation of new Torah values, new Torah values, the likes of which cannot be found in regular words of Torah. In other words, the creative enterprises that we are forced into as students when we no longer are handed the answers actually have the possibility of taking us to new heights, in this case to new Torah values, Erkei Torah Chadashim, that actually expand what it means to study and to learn. And so we return to the beginning, says Rav Hutner. The reality of debate in Torah, which continues until our own day, was indeed born in the darkness of Greece. Nonetheless, this reality is not a holdout from our redemption from Greece. On the contrary, the redemption of Hanukkah by the Hasmoneans constituted a victory over the darkness of Greece by producing light out of the darkness itself. May the Torah be magnified and exalted by way of the forgetting of Torah. Its cancellation is its fulfillment. While the fall of Babylonia and Medea helped heal the subjugation of the Jewish people, the fall of Greece contained within it a remedy prepared from the wounds itself. When the wicked Greek kingdom stood against your people Israel to make them forget the Torah, from the forgetting itself, new wellsprings of Torah opened up by way of dialectical reconstruction 
pursued in order to clarify the Torah that was being forgotten. Here, Rav Huttner's passion and his point reaches a fever pitch, which is essentially to say, what's the story of the Jewish people on Hanukkah? Not that they forgot Torah, and then when the Greeks were defeated, they found all the cliff notes that they had before and somehow uh, were back to the beginning. Instead, something very different happened. The Jewish people encountered the Greek way of life and the Greek subjugation that led them to forget Torah, and they constructed out of it a culture of disagreement and debate that ended up, in fact, enhancing the Torah beyond what it had ever been before. Here, I think you cannot avoid hearing Rav Huttner's interaction with Western philosophy and its highly dialectical forms and making the case that, in fact, that philosophy, which ultimately draws its inspiration from Greek culture, was what the rabbinic sages of old encountered and built out of it the quintessential form of Torah, of argument and debate that we take for granted as part of Jewish culture until today. And it's an incredibly powerful message for thinking about Hanukkah, because what it means is that Hanukkah is not just a story of gloating over the enemy that was defeated. Hanukkah is actually a story about what it means to adapt, to respond to the challenges of a contemporary environment, and to turn them into the very weapons of survival that will make your culture and your learning and the substantive things that are important to you live on well into the future outlasting whatever subjugating culture is holding you back. There is, I think, and very appropriate in this context, also some important discussion to be had here, which you'll turn to in a moment, about how we think about leadership and how we think about institutions. The questions of what we inherit and what we ought to forget, what we might forget, the ways in which when institutions go through rupture and crisis, and forget much of what they once took for granted, those moments actually being extraordinary opportunities for thinking about expanding mission, reach, and substance from places where they were before to places where we might not yet have dreamed they could go. This, I think, Rav Huttner is pushing us to think about as the lesson and challenge of Hanukkah. How do we, in our own dialectics, our own reconstruction, our own learning, and our own leadership, break our own tablets, find the way that the Torah that we have received actually needs to be proliferated, multiplied, made deeper, and find ways in which, in a Jewish environment where we so often talk about the threats and challenges that come from outside, we can think very concretely about the ways in which those challenges may actually lay the groundwork for the very strategies that will cause someone 100, 200, 2,000 years from now to look back at this moment in time and say, that was the time when the forces of darkening and forgetting as they may be actually came together and were redirected to create a whole new passion for Torah. I invite you to think more about those questions to encounter Rav Huttner again in the future, and I hope we will get to learn in person uh, at some point as well. Thank you.